Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon to the Singapore Polytechnic AI Virtual Symposium. We are not quite ready to begin because we're admitting the everybody that signed up. We're expecting more than 500 people from all over the region. So give us a couple more minutes. We are also await awaiting the arrival of our guest of honor, Senior Minister of State, Dr. Janil Putucheri. He should be calling in any moment now. So once all the pieces are in place, we will come to you live right here at the Singapore Polytechnic AI Virtual Symposium. My name is Ricardo. I am going to be your host and moderator. Some of you might be uh, experiencing any form of lag or blurness on the Zoom. The reason for that is, is, is because of the internet speed. Zoom does um, prioritize voice over image. So if you're experiencing any of that, don't worry, you'll still be able to follow on the programming. We will be having question and answer, so I suggest that you familiarize yourself with the question and answer function. Thank you very much. We will come to you live in about five to ten minutes time. Thank you. Pen 
Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to the Singapore Polytechnic AI Virtual Symposium. My name is Ricardo, your host and moderator for today. It is a privilege and pleasure to join you. I am the founder of an innovative online and hybrid event agency called Adrenaline, and we're very, very happy that we are partnering Singapore Poly to Polytechnic to bring this show to you. The other very important shout out is to the more than 500 of you who are watching us on Zoom. I understand we've got five, more than 500, in fact, more than 600 people sign up 
for this symposium and you are from all over the region not just singapore but we've also got vietnam philippines indonesia malaysia friends coming to join us this friday afternoon so i want to thank you for taking time to come and learn about this very exciting new frontier now if you're planning your afternoon the whole programming will take about 90 minutes give or take and it will cover two keynote addresses one from ai singapore another one from our friends and partners at uob where you will be able to ask questions that will be answered at a panel discussion a little bit later in the show so i would like to get everyone familiarized with the question and answer function on zoom that should be at the bottom of your screen there is something that says q and a so if you have any questions for our panels panelists later, please feel free to put that in the Q&A function. I cannot promise that we have time to take up every single question, but we certainly will try our best. You'll also get to witness some of the amazing projects that the Singapore Polytechnic students have embarked on in our project showcase a little bit later. But to kick off today's AI Virtual Symposium, I'm very proud to introduce our guest of honor, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information and Ministry of Health. I'm very privileged to have Dr. Janil Puttucheri here with us. SMS Janil, hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me here. Hi, good afternoon. Well, I'd just like to make a few opening remarks. Uh, thank you to Singapore Polytechnic uh, for putting this together and for uh, inviting me to join you. Uh, I'll make a few comments about the role that government can play in supporting businesses in their digitalization journey. And COVID-19 has reinforced this imperative for businesses to be digitally ready. And businesses can build a competitive advantage by using artificial intelligence responsibly. That responsible use and that early demonstration of responsible use will drive consumer trust, consumer confidence, and businesses are encouraged to refer to resources like our model AI governance framework that we've developed here in Singapore. It comes with an implementation and self-assessment guide for organizations and also a compendium of demonstrative use cases so that businesses can learn about how to deploy AI in a manner that facilitates innovation, builds trust, drives confidence. And this adoption of AI will help businesses sharpen their competitive edge and expand market opportunities. The use of AI may well be to perform functions such as data analytics on consumer preferences, customization of products and services, and also the streamlining of enterprise processes. Uh, SMEs and startups are also encouraged to explore AI's Singap AI Singapore's AI makerspace, which provides a platform for a suite of AI tools and data sets and engineering services for businesses to get going on their AI journey. But I return to my starting position, which is that Ultimately, it's about building a competitive advantage through the use of AI responsibly so that we can foster consumer trust and consumer confidence. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon and that you find it productive and useful. Thank you very much. That was our guest of honor, Senior Minister of State, Dr. Janil Puchacheri. Thank you, sir, for taking time off to join us here at the Singapore Polytechnic AI Virtual Symposium. Now, I just wanted to cover the theme for today. And the theme is none other than unboxing AI, discover your business AI strategy. So as you can tell, we are looking at how AI is going to shape the future of work, of workplaces, and of businesses. I want to thank all of our entrepreneurs, our business community, and also some of our students that have signed up and tuned in today. So wherever you're watching us from, Thank you for your support and let's carry on with the show today by introducing our first keynote speaker. He is none other than the Director of AI Innovation at AI Singapore. He's also a real visionary and a serial technopreneur. I'm very happy to welcome now Mr. Lawrence Liu. Over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and friends from all over the region. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Singapore Polytechnic for inviting me to this AI symposium. Um, there's now a lot of buzz about 
AI, and it may seem overwhelming to a lot of companies here. And this is one of the reasons why um, the Singapore government decided to start AI Singapore back in 2017. Uh, we have developed a range of programs to help boost Singapore's competitiveness, bringing together our AI researchers, engineers, together to make them available to the industry. We know we cannot do it alone, and hence partnering with Institute of Higher Learning like Singapore Polytechnic is so important to help amplify and accelerate our work. Now, let me share some of AI Singapore's programs, and in particular why it is important for companies and individuals to get on board the AI revolution. AI Singapore, like I mentioned, was started back in 2017. Uh, we have several uh, coordinating agencies that we work closely with, from NRF to IMDA, EDB, IHIS, Smart Nation Office. Our researchers and research pool comes from the various universities in Singapore, including ASTAR. But we have now extended our partnerships to the various uh, polytechnics, including Singapore Polytechnic. And our mission really is to build deep capabilities in AI for Singapore to create both social and economic impact. And the other super, super important point is to create more AI talents in Singapore. One of the ways that we are helping our companies to accelerate the adoption of AI is through a program we call the 100 Experiments. We have helped Sabana Jurong in this case to build a predictive maintenance uh, for HDB leaves. Uh, we have helped a SME, a very large SME here, to create new digital services. Uh, uh, for this SME, it was for um, uh, micro lending. Uh, we have helped a startup to analyze driver behaviors on the road. Uh, we have helped another startup uh, to do chronic wound uh, diagnosis. Uh, this is a very popular one, a singlish speech to text engine that is now being used by several agencies. And uh, we also have some companies who are interested to license this technology. Uh, we have helped agencies to detect suspicious behaviors of vehicles in our Singapore Straits. We have helped a big MNC here to basically uh, predict what sort of uh, products that they are producing that may have high return rates and you know other medical uh, diagnosis uh, AI systems. Now, these are some of the projects that have already been done and completed. Uh, in AI Singapore, we are supposed to do 100 over the next five years. And of this, we have already completed 20. We, are, we have approved 50 over projects, so it's ongoing. Now, one of the things about the AI Singapore program is this. Well, we want to do a lot of these projects. Uh, AI Singapore ourselves was also hampered by the lack of talent. Singaporean AI engineers in particular. And what we did was to create an apprenticeship program that has uh, you know, taken off. And uh, today, uh, we have hundreds of Singaporeans applying to join the program every time uh, we run a recruitment drive. And this apprenticeship program has enabled Singaporeans who are super passionate about AI and machine learning to actually cross over into this uh, exciting field. Okay? Some of them may have a computer science background, but 80% of my, my apprentice are not from a computer science background. They are engineers, bankers, lawyers. Uh, I don't have a doctor yet, but I think we may get a doctor soon. Um, other talent development capabilities that we have developed over the time is really driven by gaps that we see, uh, obstacles that we see as we're trying to get companies to adopt AI. Uh, one of, obviously, we need uh, we need Singaporeans to apply to get into our apprenticeship program, but the barrier, the technical barrier is quite high. And to help them overcome that barrier, we created a field guide to teach them, to tell them what exactly you need so that you can apply and get into our program. Uh, we created AI for everyone to demystify AI so that when we talk to a manager in an SME, he's not afraid of you know, bringing AI into the company through the 100 experiments and then you know, losing jobs. He understand what AI and how AI can help him. Uh, we created other programs to enable more working professionals to get into AI. Uh, we did not forget our students, right? We created AI for students, AI for kids, to get even our primary school kids excited about AI. And to make sure that all the 
AI talents that are not just AI Singapore's training, Singapore is training, uh, other institutions are training. There is a national benchmark, a national certification, um, sort of where people will understand the and recognize the level of expertise uh, there is. We've created a, a certification uh, uh, where we call them AI Chartered Engineers. Uh, Dr. Dr. Janil mentioned about the makerspace. The makerspace intent really is to bring to the SME ecosystem AI advisory services, pre-built solutions, platforms, data sets, which the SME can easily adopt to start their AI journey. Now, one of the big concerns that we always hear is, will AI replace your job? No. It is not going to be AI. Now, before we get into that, AI will replace tasks. Now, in a single day, in your job, you have multiple tasks. You have one job, some of you may have two jobs, but in a job, you have multiple tasks. And what really will happen is AI will replace those tasks. And just because those tasks are replaced doesn't mean you can come to office later. Your boss will give you new tasks. So it's really important to learn to keep upgrading and plus skilling yourself as you, you know, uh, uh, progress in this uh, AI revolution. So AI will not be the one that will replace your jobs. It is professionals who use AI that will replace you if you don't use AI to make yourself more productive, being able to do your job faster, better, not necessarily cheaper, but higher value add. So with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Mr. Lawrence Liu from AI Singapore. We'll be hearing a little bit more from Lawrence during the question and answer panel later. So remember, if you have any questions for Lawrence and his very interesting sharing, please put them in the Q&A function on Zoom. It's at the base of your screen. There is a Q&A button. Please click it uh, and submit your questions for Lawrence. He will be joining us for the panel discussion in just a little bit. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to have our partners from UOB to give us a more commercial and private sector perspective on artificial intelligence. We have with us Executive Director and Head Enterprise Artificial Intelligence for UOB Group, Mr. Johnson Poe. Let us welcome Johnson. Hello, sir. Good to meet you as well. Hi everyone, this is Johnson from Group Enterprise AI and Data Science at United Overseas Bank, UOB, based in Singapore. In this session, I will be sharing on the essentials of AI, paying close attention to what these concepts mean, why they matter in our context, and how we can develop these capabilities at enterprise scale. What is AI and big data? There has been much buzz revolving the notions of AI and big data in recent times, which is both fascinating and baffling. Before we dwell on the relevance of AI and big data, let us revisit these concepts, definitions, as well as underlying relationships. First, let's start with AI. AI, as you can see here, relates to any technique that allows machines to mimic human behavior. Simply put, it's about building smart machines and intelligent systems that can facilitate human effort. It can be an advanced implementation, such as a cognitive bot capable of human decision making, or a routine implementation in intelligent automation. Big data analytics is similarly a broad concept, comprising of both qualitative and quantitative techniques that allows us to derive insights from large volumes of data from a variety of sources that comes at high velocity. It comprises both the fields of data science and business analytics. Data science as a field focuses on the advanced implementation of predictive and prescriptive analytics, covering techniques such as natural language processing, graph analytics, network analysis, operations research, as well as machine learning. Business analytics, as you can see here, 
refers to the direct applications of descriptive and diagnostic analysis, such as business reporting, dashboard development, and data visualizations. AI overlaps with, with big data analytics in the fields of machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning refers to a suite of AI techniques that allows computers to learn from data without being explicitly programmed to do so. Deep learning, a subset of machine learning, refers to a suite of advanced techniques that is based upon multi-layered artificial neural networks that can enable enhanced accuracy. Many of us got to know of these concepts through the game of Go, where Google's deep learning application, AlphaGo, managed to defeat Go masters Curtia and Lee Sido. Why AI and big data matters. At the business level, AI and big data is rapidly transforming the way we work, live, and interact. In a recent study by McKinsey, AI solutions can expect potential growth of between $3.5 trillion to $5.8 trillion in value annually. There have also been more than 400 use cases identified across 19 industries. In a similar study by Accenture, it is estimated that a financial institution can expect cost savings of up to 25% if AI and big data is implemented effectively. Here are some trends on the application of AI and big data in the financial industry. In the space of wealth management, robo-advisors have enabled banks and fintechs to provide automated algorithm-driven financial planning services with minimal to no human supervision. AI-driven, goals-based, and risk-based strategies can now be executed seamlessly. Enhancing activities such as portfolio rebalancing, dollar cost averaging, as well as active monitoring. In the space of digital retail banking, AI capabilities such as facial recognition has enabled banks and fintechs to onboard customers without the need for face-to-face -face interaction, thereby consolidating the end-to-end -end customer engagement journey in a single application. In the space of regulatory compliance, transaction surveillance for the purpose of fraud detection and anti-money laundering have traditionally been a, an intensive manual process where investigators dedicate much time, effort, and resources in managing large volumes of alerts in suspicious activities. Leveraging AI and big data and machine learning, banks are now empowered to analyze millions of data points to detect complex fraudulent transactions within a matter of seconds. In the space of inclusive banking and risk management, which aims to make banking more accessible to the unbanked population, as well as small businesses with limited or no credit history. The use of machine learning coupled with alternative data sets have allowed uh, banks to overcome constraints of uh, solely relying on bank statements and transactions when making and assessing credit worthiness. In the space of cybersecurity, real-time analytics and deep learning have enabled banks and financial institutions to detect threats, fix vulnerabilities, as well as to mitigate consequences of cyber breaches. How then do we implement AI and big data? An effective AI and big data implementation is anchored upon three key enablers as follows, namely people, process, and technology. Allow me to elaborate as follows. People. Many individuals play important roles as part of the end-to-end -end AI and big data pipeline. I would like to think of these individuals as AI superheroes. The first group of individuals, which I refer to as data heroes, comprises the AI product manager, the data engineer, data scientist, and machine learning engineer. Their responsibilities include AI translation, data management, data processing, analytics, machine learning, as well as product development, packaging, and deployment. The second group of individuals, which I refer to as business heroes, comprises the AI product owner and business analysts. Their responsibilities are to drive the development effort, 
in alignment with business objectives while understanding that AI is an ongoing process that requires consistent feedback, continuous integration, and continuous learning. Last but not least, we have the technology heroes, comprising of platform engineers, as well as solution architects. Their responsibilities are to help build the big data and AI platform on which the AI, uh, on which the data heroes, as well as the business heroes can operate. Process. In implementing AI at scale, it's important that we have a well-defined process. Based on research conducted of industry best practices, the AI and big data lifecycle comprises three main phases as follows. Phase one, initialization phase, where we translate business requirements into AI requirements and conduct feasibility studies. Phase two, model development phase, where data scientists build analytical machine learning models and conduct pilot testing. Phase three, operationalization phase, where data scientists and machine learning engineers come together to package and deploy their models as AI product. The loop in the middle of this life cycle signifies that AI is an ongoing process that requires continuous feedback, monitoring, and refinement to account for performance degradation over time. Technology. In supporting the AI-driven pipeline, we need to assemble a platform and a suite of tools to fulfill the requirements of data ingestion, storage, parallel processing, query processing, model development, machine learning, as well as insights delivery, as you can see here. Data ingestion is a process of obtaining and importing data for the purpose of immediate use or for subsequent storage in databases. Parallel processing refers to the branch of computation where calculations and processes are implemented simultaneously across a cluster of machines. Whereas query processing refers to the process of translating high level queries into low level expressions for execution by machines. Data analytics and insights delivery have been defined earlier. Examples of tools relating to these layers includes programming languages such as R, Python, and Scala, as well as enterprise visualization tools comprising Click, Tableau, as well as Power BI. There are also open source packages such as Shiny for R and Plotly for Python that allows us to build custom applications and data visualizations. At UOB, our efforts in driving AI and big data have been well recognized by the industry, having received multiple awards conferred by international organizations. We're especially delighted that our most recent achievements include the Global Cloudera Data Impact Award for the category Enterprise AI, which is conferred in conjunction with the prestigious Strata Conference in New York City in 2019. Last but not least, how can we participate in this journey? Well, for a start, gain a good appreciation of AI and big data understand the why and what of AI, look out for opportunities and business contexts where we can bring value based on AI. Next, equip yourselves with theoretical knowledge as well as practical understanding of the AI and big data life cycle and hone your skill in a specialization of your respective domain. Last but not least, as we move ahead as a practitioner, do be aware of best practices in the responsible use of AI as Dr. Janelle has mentioned. Keep your implementations well aligned with the principles of fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. I look forward to the wider adoption of AI and big data in the industry in the near future. With that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnson. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, sir. All right, that was Johnson Poe from our key partner at uh, UOB. I just want to just give a big shout out to the people that made this possible. Of course, UOB, FinLab, powered by UOB, AI Singapore, SG Tech, and Skills Future Singapore, all of whom have come together to make this symposium proudly organized by Singapore Polytechnic a reality. Uh, this is a lot of work to bring this project 
to fruition. Uh, there are, I think, more than 500 of you watching us online from all over ASEAN right now. So I just want to give a big shout out to our organizers, Singapore Polytechnic, uh, Audrey, Helmi, Jenny, Shannon, Dee, the people that work so hard behind the scenes. Thank you so much for bringing this valuable content to all of us. Uh, but speaking about Singapore Poly, we cannot forget their students. And their students have worked incredibly hard to showcase four projects here today. They are in the areas of data analytics, video analytics, image recognition, and autonomous vehicles. So without further ado, let's roll the video. What a wonderful showcase video of the projects, some of the projects that the students at Singapore Poly have embarked on. Those, that was just a selection, but on a you know, semestral basis, the, the students are coming up with more and more innovative pro uh, projects every single semester. So to all the students that were featured, congratulations and thank you for your hard work. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go into our panel discussion and you've heard from uh, Lawrence and Johnson just now. I'm going to bring on my third panelist. He is from Singapore Polytechnic and he's none other than Dr. Peter Leong, Senior Lecturer, Specialist AI and Analytics. And he will be representing the more academic angle of the conversation. Let me bring off three of my panelists on screen right now. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, hi, Ricardo. Uh, thank Hello. you, thank you. So uh, as you can see, uh, we have gathered a national perspective from AI Singapore represented by Lawrence. We have a commercial perspective represented by uh, UOB and uh, Johnson. And of course, an academic perspective, and this is represented by Peter from Singapore Polytechnic. I'm going to get everybody to keep your questions coming in. I already see about six or seven questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. So it's going to be, uh, I've, I've got about 30 minutes with the gentleman. So I think I can afford to get to about maybe eight to 10 questions. Uh, but CK actually asked the question I wanted to kick off with, which is, gentlemen, uh, what excites you most? What, what excites you most? I'm going to keep off, kick off a more, more general question, right? AI, uh, Johnson, as you mentioned, it has so many different realms, right? If you had to choose one area in which its implementation excites you most, which one would it be? We'll start with you and we'll work our way across. Yeah, uh, I would like to follow up on my, uh, on my point earlier about AI being a multidisciplinary process. So in fact, this is exactly what excites me. As you can see, uh, different people and different professionals, different processes can all play a role as part of this journey, right? In fact, you're just looking at the, the number of people involved in the AI journey alone. Uh, just by just focusing on those technical uh, roles, you can see that there are hosts of uh, opportunities, right, for, for you and I, for different types of professionals. Even if you're a business, uh, business professional with no background, with no technical background in computer science and mathematics and statistical modeling, you can still play a part as part of this end-to-end -end journey, right? As you can see, we have data heroes, business heroes, as well as technology heroes, and they all play equally critical role as part of this end-to-end -end process of delivering the AI product. So this is something that really excites me is because everybody can play a part. And at the same time, as you can see, uh, there's a host of processes that are involved when it comes to implementing AI. 
right? This is an iterative process. It's an ongoing process of continuous learning, integration, and improvement. And it's this vibrant as well as dynamic process that really excites me the most mm. ultimately at the end of the day. Thank yep. you for that, Johnson. Thank you. Lawrence? Yeah. Uh, so in AI, there are several uh, techniques or technology that, that um, you know, has really uh, progressed very far, uh, in particular computer vision uh, and natural language processing. So these are two areas that uh, personally I'm very excited about and uh, also uh, which AI Singapore is, is, is um, working on. Uh, a lot of projects with the industry in these two, two fields. But what really, um, you know, get myself, my team super excited about AI is really uh, the ability to train the next generation of Singaporeans to, to get into AI. And um, in our apprenticeship program, we have broken the, 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 the myth that you need to be a computer scientist to do AI. And like what I mentioned earlier, we have apprentices coming from all walks of life. And as long as you are passionate, you, have, you are able to learn fast, you have learned all the basics, uh, you pass our test, we will take you in. Is it a difficult test? <laughs> Good question, right? Um, our, our, our apprenticeship program is so, so popular now that we actually appears, uh, we appear, appeared on um, you know, Hardware Zone, Eat Men, Drink Women Forum. And someone actually mentioned that it's actually easier to get into Harvard than to get into the AIP program. <laughs> So there is some prep work and maybe that's where Singapore Polytechnic does come in. Um, I'm going to go over to Peter now. Peter, what excites you? What excites me? Well, AI is a superpower, right? It makes you into a data superhero like what Johnson mentioned. So it, what really excites me is that it's, it's actually a, a technology or a tool, a tool that actually expands the human uh, capability to be able to recognize things or patterns that... Uh, elude the normal human being. Uh, the other thing which really excites me is that AI is becoming much more pervasive than in former times. AI is actually not a new field. Uh, it's actually been around since the 1950s, but there has been a resurgence of AI in uh, recent years. And the other word which I would actually think uh, excites me about AI is that embedding. AI is getting embedded into many things that uh, we are using every day. Think about Siri in your smartphone. Okay, that's a very obvious one. You can ask Siri to do various things. But another more subtle one is that actually the, any picture that you're taking with an iPhone or Samsung phone right now, or even a Huawei phone, is the AI in it that actually enables it to take amazing pictures with a reasonable sensor. It's actually embedded within the capability of the device itself. And you wouldn't actually think about, hey, I'm using AI when you take a picture with an uh, iPhone or Samsung. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Peter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you as I go on to the next theme, right? And this theme really is sort of where we are vis-a-vis -vis where we need to be. Right, from, from a student perspective, from a national perspective, from a company's perspective. So from our students' perspective, um, how ready would you say, as you look at your students on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, are they equipped, are they curious enough, do they have the base skills required as we embark on this journey from, a, from, from an academic perspective? Uh, thanks for throwing me that question. Uh, actually, to, to me, uh, I'm in the education sector and I'm teaching in the Singapore Poly, my students actually, to them, the digital domain is like duck taking to water, right? So I also uh, teach students uh, from the night classes as well, uh, from adults. And to them, some of these uh, older students, actually, the domain is not so natural to them. So actually, our younger students have a tremendous advantage uh, in terms of being very ready for the technology. And I think one of the things which actually drives AI in the modern age and why it was, uh, there's a resurgence is actually really the internet. Because of the growth of the internet, because of the growth of mobile devices, you have actually gathered so much more data about people, about the world. And that presence of uh, data coupled with... Uh, more capable uh, computing cap power really drives the development of AI uh, today. Thank you. It's good to hear that uh, the young people have a natural curiosity and, 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 and are equipped at least to start the journey. Uh, I, I want to ask a question of Lawrence, and this is actually a question from uh, one of the attendees, right? Uh, which is where Singapore is vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, the region, 
or even globally. Uh, are we considered ahead? Are we just in the journey? I mean, I know a country like China, for example, feels like they, they, they have made lots of progress. So where are we as a country, sir? Um, so that's a good question, right? So I, I sit on several committees and some of them are international committees. And, and if, you know, I, I, when I started with, with AI Singapore, we, we, we thought that, okay, AI Singapore being, you know, Singapore being a small country, you know, we, we are, we, we, we are, you know, would think that we are quite far away, but, um, you know, in terms of AI research, uh, there are several indexes um, that, that academics look at and Singapore is actually ranked one of the top in, in AI research. Okay. Um, as we interact with uh, other uh, uh, colleagues all over the world, um, everyone is actually very impressed by uh, AI Singapore various programs. And uh, the way that we run our 100 experiments, the way we do talent development, mm, mm. Um, we have not just countries, we have other organizations, foundations that are coming to us to say, you know, teach me how, show me, explain to me, uh, walk me through the ropes, uh, what's the playbook to run an apprenticeship program. Mm, mm. So I think in terms of policies and programs, uh, AI Singapore is really, or Singapore is uh, you know, right up there. Mm. Obviously in terms of AI applications, um, you have China, the use cases there are, are, are huge. Uh, but don't forget like what you know, Peter mentioned, AI, AI actually has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually a lot of AI being embedded and used by everyone. Um, it's just that you know, it's becoming a lot more visible today. Uh, so yes, China is ahead in terms of large scale implementation, but there are a lot of SMEs, a lot of startups that are already deploying a lot of AIs here today in Singapore. Got it. Thank you very much, Lawrence Johnson. Uh, today's theme is actually extremely related to, to your space because it's about discovering your business AI strategy. Tell us a little bit more, uh, what's going to happen for businesses that know what AI is all about vis-a-vis -vis businesses that have absolutely no idea. So sort of, is there going to be a huge divide between businesses that implement and don't implement? Right, I guess uh, from a business angle, as I mentioned, there's clearly a value for AI. And uh, if you recall what I've mentioned within my uh, presentation as well, uh, there's a good potential of generating uh, between $3.5 trillion uh, and up to $5.5 trillion in value annually, right, with regard to the commercial space. At the same time, there have, uh, there have also been multiple use cases that have already been explored and identified where AI can actually play a part. Right. Uh, take, for example, in the context of a uh, banking and financial sector, I've listed out a lot of, a couple of good use cases. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. And there are lots of uh, use cases where AI as well as big data and analytics can actually play a, play a role in. So I guess moving forward, especially in our current situation, right, uh, post pandemic context, where a lot of our interactions actually moved from a physical kind of context into a, into a digital space, uh, there'll be an increased role that AI as well as big data will play a part. Right, given the uh, accelerated context for digital transformation. So this is where, I guess, as you mentioned, uh, AI and big data, if a business knows how to harness uh, the capacity as well as the potential of AI, uh, it, it is going to provide you with the competitive edge uh, versus vis -a -vis, uh, versus another organization that may not be able to embrace uh, these capabilities as quickly. Mm. Right? So in short, I guess there are numerous opportunities right, in the business space. Uh, it's really all about how we can connect the techniques or what, I'm, what I call map the techniques right, to the right use cases, identify that and be able to execute that in a, in a scale as well as accelerated pace. Got it. Thank you very much. So clearly, if you are a business owner watching, it's time to either start or, or hire someone that can help you start looking into this space. Now, we are about halfway through the question and answer. And like every good movie, right? About halfway through, you have crisis, uh, you have difficulty. So I want to move the conversation a little bit, gentlemen, um, into some of your concerns. All right. I mean, uh, things like data privacy, cybersecurity, um, um, you know, getting lost in social media, TikTok videos. Um, so can I get everyone to share with me uh, as AI becomes more, more pertinent, right? As, as your phone tells you it's time to stand up, as your, 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 your watch tells you what time to wake up and how fast your heart is beating, what are some major concerns you see um, in terms of AI implementation? Uh, perhaps we'll start, this time I think we can start with Lawrence and then we'll work our way. Um, my, so 
um, just was it two days ago? Mm -hmm. uh, some someone sent a, a PDF to a, a, a private uh, a, a mailing list, and and I was looking looking through. Uh, they were trying to explain AI through comics. I was just glancing through, you know, what what they they were doing, and and I saw a statement that that they that uh, you know in, in the in comics it was stated right. Uh, oh, now you can use AI through simple uh, API calls or, or web calls without understanding or knowing data science. Uh, that's actually very, very dangerous and actually very, very irresponsible. So I actually raised that up and, and um, the publisher agreed and actually they retracted the document. Um, today, uh, there are very, AI today, if you know, uh, you can actually deploy it very easily. Okay, uh, but that's if you know. If not, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out, and that's why you get into various uh, uh, fiasco. Like you know, some of the big uh, U.S. companies got into last couple of months um, because yes, it can be very easy to use an AI algorithm, but if you are not trained in the fundamentals, you're going to train the algorithm wrongly, and you're going to get into issues. So that that's to me is the biggest concern and and uh, something that we stress uh, to um, users, to industry partners, to our trainees, and so on, right? To people we meet, uh, that uh, yes, today you have very easy to use AI algorithms, auto ML, and so on, but it's going to be garbage in, garbage out if you don't understand the fundamentals. Yeah. So that, that, I think it's a very clear message, right? Get your fundamentals right, get your basics right before stepping into the space. Maybe allow me to Please. chip in here as well. So as Lawrence uh, mentioned earlier, uh, I especially uh, basically relate very well to what he has mentioned because uh, in our daily uh, operations as well as in our business, um, especially when it comes to interacting with customers, a lot of us uh, use chatbots right, to interface with our customers. So the context for chatbots here is that it's actually extremely simple to build a chatbot Right. Any, I think given our technology stack as well as services provided and enabled by our tech companies as well as, well as cloud service providers nowadays, it's, it actually takes us a couple of minutes just to deploy a chatbot. But it's extremely difficult and challenging to build a chatbot that's really good, that really functions as what it, it should be. Right. So therein lies the context for why we should really uh, practice the responsible use of AI. Right. First of all, in understanding uh, the inner workings, right, the context for AI, the algorithms, as well as the data that we feed into the AI uh, models in order to build a solution all right, that is uh, capable, relevant, uh, and ultimately something that will bring, uh, that will generate value and, uh, redu and enhance operational efficiency right, for both uh, employees, customers, as well as the practitioners. Over to you, Dr. Leong. Uh, well, let me echo the experience of another Peter who's a superhero. Uh, Peter Parker, also known as Spider-Man, once heard from Uncle Ben to tell him that with great power comes great responsibility. So this is very true for AI as well, right? It, it really enhances our ability to do a lot of things. But with that great power, I think uh, we have to be very much more responsible in our use of it. So I want to thank Dr. Puttacherry for starting off uh, with his opening address to just remind us that the responsible use of AI would actually help to drive the technology forward. So much my other fear for AI is that actually, uh, to a lot of people actually, they are very much hung up on the past, right? So actually AI allows us to uh, do away with many of the things that we took for granted. I always tell my students that uh, if you go to your computer and you look at the save button, it looks like a diskette. And they all look at me blankly and ask me, what is a disket? They don't know. Actually, my students, 16, 17 year old, they have not, never seen a disket before. Those who are older in the audience probably know what it is. Actually, it's a, it's a storage device. And today, we are all very used to using a keyboard and mouse. And uh, we have also the devices. For example, when we want to go into a lift, we have to press the button to get the lift. Along comes COVID, right? And uh, actually, it would be much better if we could just voice activate it. Imagine voice activation for everything. Voice recognition is already a very advanced technology. It's very, very accurate now. I would say above 90% accurate most of the time. So why aren't we using it more extensively? Why are we still using a mouse and a keyboard? And I think this is just very ridiculous. Uh, 
way of thinking about things. Uh, we are just too used to the technology because it's been around for a long time. Uh, actually, AI opens up a lot of venues uh, for us to really rethink of, about the way we are doing things. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, uh, on, on a word of caution. All right, but at the same time, optimistically, if we get our fundamentals and basics right, that would be a good start. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a, a lot of people in the Q&A function is asking about specific industries. So I think it's going to be a bit too time consuming to talk about, okay, just AI in, in, in medical or AI in music. Uh, for example, I've got Xuan, Xuan Ming that has asking, uh, how has AI been used in music? I have another person asking about AI in, in the medical industry, computer science. Uh, but I, I will ask in more general sense, from a use case perspective, do you see a certain industry as going to implement AI a lot faster, a lot more effectively, right? Of course, uh, look at FinTech, it's quite clear, right? But are there, are there one or two other industries that you see are going to adopt AI very quickly and it's going to either start changing our lives or affecting us very soon? Um, and whoever is ready from, uh, yep. Um, well, you know, AI today, are, are, you know, like what Peter said, right? It's already embedded into all your consumer devices. Mm -hmm. so you're already using AI and it's affecting you on, on a daily basis. But um, to me, the, the biggest impact of, of AI is uh, going to be in healthcare. Um, AI um, will not cure cancer. But hopefully, right, with AI and IoT and, sen and, and, and sensors, right, uh, we can detect uh, uh, cancer cells or markers so early in advance that that uh, it doesn't become life threatening at all. Imagine waking up, going to the toilet, uh, you know, doing your business, and you say, "Hey, you know, we detect something uh, different in in your urine. Please uh, go and see a doctor within the next six months." You can solve it early enough, then it doesn't become life threatening. So I think uh, AI in healthcare will will fundamentally change. Uh, uh, healthcare, and it will also, you know, hopefully extend uh, 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 lives for for everyone here. Thank you, Johnson. Any thoughts? Right. So I I think um uh, as I've discussed earlier, there are basically two broad classes of AI implementations. Right. The first of which is focused on uh, cognitive capabilities as well as machine learning and AI, uh, as well as uh, deep learning implementations. Uh, and then the second class refers to, uh, relates to the intelligent automation to enhance operational efficiency. Uh, the first class of problems is pretty much uh, dependent on the data that we can actually feed uh, into the models uh, so that the machines can actually learn based on past experiences, uh, insights, as well as historical data so that it can basically form patterns and create uh, functions uh, that can uh, facilitate human decision making. So um, I would like to take on a more agnostic context to the application of AI. I, I totally agree with uh, Lawrence that I think uh, healthcare is one of the industries where AI can actually play a very major role in, uh, as well as fin financial industry, as uh, Ricardo has mentioned earlier as well. Uh, but um, at a higher level, right, uh, whichever area in industry where there's large corpus of information and data, right, untapped data, unstructured, you know, structured information, and there's uh, any desire to want to basically automate processes, as well as build models that allows us to make predictions, as well as prescribe actions uh, to solve business challenges. Uh, I would think that these are all good contexts where AI can actually make it, make it smart. Yeah. Dr. Leung, do you see potential in any particular space? Well, I'm actually uh, in a so-called lag adopter industry, which is education. So actually, I see there's a huge potential for AI in education. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been known as one of the lead adopters, unlike uh, fintech or even uh, manufacturing. So that's one area which I hope to see uh, AI grow more, uh, how it can help students learn better, how we can uh, personalize education at a, at a deeper level. Uh, uh, some of many of these things uh, we can do. We, we, are, we are collecting the data, no doubt, uh, from our students every day uh, during their lessons. But we are, as an educator, I'm not really able to fully utilize that data to, to make better decisions out of it. And I hope this is one of the areas that we can work on uh, in AI. Uh, other things like what was mentioned, the chatbots, how chatbots can be integrated in. Those are some of the low hanging fruits uh, that can be used to automate, so, uh, I, I used to uh, share my uh, WhatsApp numbers uh, to my students, but I re quickly realized that that might not be a very good idea 
because uh, they keep messaging me at weird hours, uh, especially when assignments are due. So I am actually been uh, thinking about creating a Peter bot to address all these questions so they can get their answers quickly. And at the same time, I can still have my rest. So, so they'll talk to a virtual version of uh, Dr. Peter in that case. Okay, I, I will stick with you, uh, Dr. Leong, because uh, because um, uh, SP is uh, Singapore Poly is really Singapore Polytechnic is really at the forefront. Uh, cons, cons, all things considered, right? This is actually the second symposium. The last one I did was was a year ago. So you guys have have already started that journey. But yet you mentioned and correctly so that education is a little bit of a lag indicator industry in this space, which blows my mind, right? Because we need to get the young people ready for that future. So what more needs to be done, sir? I think, um, first of all, uh, th thanks for helping us to organize this symposium as well. I think the message needs to go out more. Uh, we have just started like last year uh, and already uh, we have come a long way. Yep. Uh, there's still a journey ahead, but I think more people need to be involved uh, besides the few people who have gotten this started. I think uh, it's actually every educator can potentially use AI. Uh, there shouldn't be any fear. It's the tool. It's not something that will uh, to, will trip you up. You can actually expand what you are able to do uh, a lot faster, a lot more effectively. So I would just encourage more educators, uh, besides those people who are teaching AI directly, take advantage of the capabilities that AI is able to uh, present to you and just use them in your lessons. Um, I'd like to add to that, right? Um, that, that, that's super important. And, uh, but also there's another dimension. Um, educators need to understand, uh, you know, AI, the use of AI. And importantly, they need to update their materials to take into account that the future of work will be a one where AI is going to be, be there and whichever uh, graduate you're training, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, accountant, will have to know how to use an AI tool and understand how AI works in their domain. So uh, I had you know, a very interesting conversation with, with a senior partner in law firm many years ago, and he said, as a young lawyer, he had to spend many hours in, in the library to, uh, you know, when, when trying to uh, uh, put together a case uh, with his fellow junior lawyers and come up with uh, a case. Uh, a summary and then uh, present it to the senior partner to say, okay, this is you know how we should fight the case. These are the historical judgment and so on and so forth. But moving forward, it's a press of the button and 30 seconds, the summary is out. And the junior lawyers coming out from NUS law, law faculty, let's say, will no, lo will no longer have the experience of learning, going through that library experience, spending hours working through, through huge amount of, of, of uh, past cases, right? That learning experience will have disappeared. So what professors and so on needs to teach will be, okay, now there's this AI tool, the future of work has changed. How do I need to create new curriculum, enhance my curriculum to take into account that this is how the new work is going to be done. All right. Um, I have a few questions uh, from the chat. Wenson um, and a few of you have asked uh, to sort of localize the conversation a little bit, right? And and, and we've spoken very broadly. Uh, concerns about AI, um, you know, um, what are the what are opportunities? What are the threats? Uh, but in Singapore specifically, in Singapore specifically, and and, and I know Lawrence, you've spoken about the different projects that that, that AISG has been. Uh, doing, but in Singapore specifically, what do you think we'll start seeing a lot more of? I know, for example, our our um, identity card is now online, right? Some of these things. Uh, will we be seeing more of that uh, coming on board uh, in from a local context in Singapore? What do you think we'll see a bit more? Maybe we start with Lawrence. Uh, yeah, so so I, I think um, uh, GovTech is working on a lot of very interesting projects uh, that has uh, AI and machine learning involved. I think in the news, a couple of months back, you saw uh, uh, they, them working together with NEA to deploy that robotic dog to make sure <laughs> you know, people social distance in the yeah, park. Was, I think quite effective, quite uh, scary. Uh, dog yeah, so, so um, there, there will be a lot of this, this uh, from, from a government 
uh, uh, perspective. But I think you're also seeing a lot of startups, uh, you know, even in, in finance and, 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 and all, right? Especially, you know, everybody is working from home and, and ordering food online. Uh, a lot of those apps actually have some form of machine learning and AI behind. They know what are your favorite food uh, based on what you have ordered previously, uh, uh, past week, week ago, and then they may make a recommendation and so on. So uh, we're going to see a lot of, of uh, AI embedded into the apps. Uh, Johnson, do you see, in, in from a Singapore context, local context, any changes coming? I do see that there will be an increasing context for AI ecosystems, right? As well as a uh, uh, data sharing and knowledge sharing uh, opportunities and platform uh, cross industry. Of course, in a well managed and uh, uh, and uh, well managed as well as a, a risk focused manner, right? So I think this is certainly one area that we'll see a lot of developments in, uh, and, and and especially in the context of risk management as well, because I think both of them actually goes hand in hand, right? Uh, as we progress along digitally, right, there has to be a, uh, the, the progress in risk management management as well as regulatory uh, regulatory compliance as well as uh, as well as guidelines will also have to uh, be in sync, right, so that we can actually manage this whole process in a well structured manner. Okay, Doctor Long, uh, what I see is that um, we are teaching uh, students uh, mathematics from primary one from a very young age. And the mathematics are very wide applications in their life as they grow up. I think that AI being such a transformational technology will just move further downstream. I think it will not be something that we will start introducing only at a poly level. Mm -hmm. Although I know Singapore Poly is the first to introduce this at a poly level uh, and we paved the way, but I think it will go further. It will go down to the secondary schools and possibly even down to the primary schools. It will not be at the same level, but I think the technology is so pervasive and so important that we cannot afford to actually uh, uh, delay until a later stage. Everybody should have an opportunity to at least know more about technology from an earlier age. Got it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Leong. Okay, we are now going to move on to really to the final segment of uh, today's Q&A panel discussion. Thank you so much for all your questions, but I thought I would start wrapping up, gentlemen, um, with a, a theme of jobs and work within this space. Considering we are in the midst of a pandemic and a recession, uh, this is one of the many, uh, one of the few uh, bright sparks, technology, AI, digitalization. Uh, and uh, there have been many questions on the, the, the Q&A function about really just starting out. But I, I want to be a slightly more specific. Uh, how can we start if budgets are limited or knowledge is limited? So for example, uh, Johnson, specifically for you, if I was an SME, right, as opposed to a big MNC ready to go, how do I get started? So the good thing about AI is that there are multiple layers to it and there are multiple components to, to AI and it's, uh, as well as the, its implementations. So I think the, the, the recommendation here is really to get started, right? The AI is actually for every, uh, every facade of, of, the, uh, of the hierarchy, right? No matter how big your, your business is, you can be a small business, you can be a medium-sized business, the SMEs, as well as large corporate organizations. And uh, for the small businesses, right, if you're getting started, I guess there are certain advantages that you have in comparison to the large corporate organizations, uh, pretty much because you're starting from a clean slate. Mm -hmm. Right. And because of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the size, the smaller size of your organization, right, you can actually implement this in a more accelerated fashion, right? There are less processes, right? And there are less legacy systems within your organization. And in fact, it, it uh, offers you the perfect opportunity, right, to leapfrog. Right, you're not playing a catch up game right here. If you're a small or SME kind of like context, you're not, you don't have to play catch up to the big corporate organizations, right? Just, that, just like how China has leapfrogged beyond uh, Singapore, right? As well as our region in terms of payment systems, uh, the context is similar, right? For small, medium-sized enterprises. So it I would almost actually recommend the playing field. Correct, yeah. to, to actually get started because uh, there's a lot more uh, opportunities as well as flexibility and versatility, right? When it comes to embracing new technologies. So Peter, uh, now over to you. I'm, I'm also going to specify that question a little bit from a get started perspective. The, the young people, it seems like they're digital natives, right? They, they right. probably was, have, have some level of curiosity and being equipped. But what about those mid-career folks who are trying to change jobs, trying to 
trying to enter this space, it does seem like the barriers are fairly high. Any recommendations? Okay, uh, I actually am the course chair for the specialist diploma in AI and data science. So uh, it's actually a very affordable course. I think uh, as a Singaporean or PR, you're only paying like, uh, it's 80, 80 over percent subsidized. So you're paying, paying a fraction of the cost. And uh, it's an eight month program. Uh, we really go deep into both machine learning as well as uh, deep learning itself as well as some of the AI applications. So uh, sign up for the course. Uh, we have two enrollments per year. Uh, once in eight, uh, the next registration will be in uh, December. Okay, so we were the first to actually launch such a course for uh, mid-career individuals or people who are basically working professionals. It's a, it's a part-time course. Uh, but since then, actually, I think every other poly also has a similar course as well. Uh, I would say that we have the most experience, but the space is limited and the queue is long. I uh, must not kid you. So you have to really sign up fast. So first come first December, you better sign up immediately if you want to actually enroll in my course. Uh, but if you are not able to get in, uh, you can go to RP, uh, TP, NYP. Uh, they, they also have a similar kind of uh, course as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Leong, for that commercial break. Uh, <laughs> much, much appreciated. I think you caught the ball very well there. Um, I'm now, I'm not gonna head over to to, to Lawrence and and uh, you know how you said your test was difficult. <laughs> so how do we prepare? How do we take that first step in that journey? Um, yeah. So so the, the the good thing is is really you know also what what Peter alluded to uh, earlier, right? Uh, because on the internet. Um, there are so much resources out there today that you can actually learn. And uh, the problem is not, not lack of resource, it's just too many. You do not know which, which course, uh, which program to sign up, which book to read, which website to follow. And what AI Singapore have done uh, is really, uh, we created a AI apprenticeship field guide to provide people guidance on what are the different techniques and technology uh, resources or books that, that you should actually review if you want to get into the apprenticeship program. Uh, that said, uh, to prepare, right, we have uh, apprentices that actually uh, come from uh, attending uh, Singapore Poly courses. They go through that, they get their, their, their hands, their feet wet, and they continue learning because uh, often they need a lot more uh, uh, depth then they apply. Now, uh, typically what will happen, and we do this purposely, is that even if we know that this guy is not going to be able to make it, or this lady is not going to be able to make it, we still, ex we still get him to come and take a test. And when he say, oh, okay, it's really above me, uh, I need to go and learn more, then he will then go learn and then come back and apply again. So we have people who are successful after their second or third try. So uh, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, my oldest apprentice is 60 years old this year. It is not impossible. If you put your heart to it, you can make it. Thank you. That was a beautiful note to wrap up our Q&A segment today. My sincere thanks to my three panelists from UOB Johnson, from AI Singapore Lawrence, and from Singapore Polytechnic, Dr. Peter Leong. And a sincere thank you to all of you that have asked the questions as well. My apologies if we couldn't get to all. Uh, I tried my best to synthesize the different questions and themes, and I believe the panel has answered most of the themes very, very insightfully. So thank you to our panel once again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to move on to the next and final segment. And this is a surprise segment, not surprise, a bonus, a bonus segment. And uh, this is where Dr. Peter Leong will be speaking to us about the business AI canvas. All right, uh, we're very, privilege that he's going to share this very important tool uh, with us. And it's very, very functional, right? At the end of the programming today, we will be able to we will be able to share that file with you via QR code. So make sure you pay attention to Peter because he'll be taking you through a very actionable, practical tool to kick off your AI journey. I'm going to hand the time over once again to Dr. Peter Leong. Okay, thank you uh, for, for that. Uh, well, I have the privilege of having the final word. <laughs> so uh, thanks, thanks to the organizers for that. Now, I like the team uh, Unboxing AI. 
So, so you know Christmas is just around the corner. So after you unbox uh, your present, you would really want to start using it, right? So actually the purpose of the business uh, canvas really is uh, to help you with that. Okay, so after you unbox AI, what do you do? So a lot of uh, people often ask me, so how do they get started, right? How do they get started? So actually this canvas was uh, designed uh, and I use it in part of my course to basically help people to think through how to get started in a particular business problem. So I'm going to take you through one of the uh, case studies uh, in an area which actually uh, my favorite author, Bernard Ma, also points out this is probably an area where AI can be used uh, in the retail space. So there are many references uh, on some of the possible use cases. So AI is actually the study done by McKinsey. So if, for you who are interested, do go, take a look at this uh, particular reference. Uh, it will have many, many good insights for you. So this is my scenario, which I want to talk about. Uh, I want to basically, uh, this is a fictitious company called SG.SME, and they have a very important business problem to solve. And that is, uh, they want to know how well a particular product, SG widget, uh, is selling. Because uh, with this uh, uh, understanding, then they are able to basically restock or re, uh, re replenish their inventory with the right amount. So re restocking products with best sellers is actually quite crucial for many businesses around the world, whether it's a physical shop or it's an online shop. So having a way to predict how well product uh, is going to sell uh, is e essential. So one application area is really just to keep uh, available stocks that are likely to sell instead of having a overloaded inventory with things that are very slow moving. So this is a scenario. So how are we going to think about this uh, and or un or frame it as an AI problem? How are we going to use AI uh, to do help this? Okay, so this is where the business canvas, uh, which will be given to you later, would help. Okay, so it's in the case, it's in the same form of a, of a grid like pattern. So when you look, first look at this, you may be wondering, oh, where do I start with this thing? Okay, so the point of this is that really you should focus on the value that AI creates for you first, which is actually the center box, right? What value is created for you? So just now we, when we were looking at the problem, we are trying to see, or oh, we want to see how well we can restock our items so that they are not actually overstocked. But why do you want to do that? What's the value in it for you to be able to uh, restock at the proper level? So we have to think about how uh, that actually uh, improves your business. For example, uh, in this case, the value that it creates for you is that it reduces the risk of having a large inventory of slow moving products by adjusting the stock levels of SG widgets to match the what you are able to predict for that level. Right, so that's definitely a business value in there. And having that particular um, uh, prediction then helps you to actually control the inventory. Then we, the canvas basically helps you to think around this problem. So that's the value that we want to create. How do we achieve this? Now, if you look at the canvas, uh, the, the value is that you want to achieve is in the center. But to the right is more uh, focused on your users, your customers, right? How are people affected by this new thing that you're trying to achieve? Whereas on the left hand side, it's actually focused on the technology, okay? And on the data that you need to solve this particular problem using AI. So the canvas is ready to help you to get started. So uh, now I know what I'm going to uh, focus on. I'm trying to focus on getting a very accurate prediction of my stock levels so, because that will give me business value. So if you look to the extreme right, how does this uh, ability uh, make your decisions better? So basically, number one, on the top right-hand corner, having this ability uh, to will make your decisions better because you would reduce errors due to just guesstimating, right? For most people, uh, when they have a product, um, they have past records, but if you have a lot of data, you may not have a very, very, very accurate prediction. Okay, it's just a guesstimate. So having a more accurate prediction will reduce the errors due to this guesstimate. And the second thing that you want to do is basically to understand if you have this ability to estimate the stock level, what is your measure of success in doing this? Right? How do you know, what do how do you measure uh, success? when you're able to do this. So in this case, uh, 
uh, we just have a very simple one. Uh, that if you are able to guess uh, the stock level within 10% of the actual, then we are pretty sure that it's better than the guesstimate. So in, that, in other words, if the stock level is typically 10, if I guess 9 or 11, that's within the bounds that is acceptable to me. But if I guess something that's outside that, then basically I need to go back and redo this again. So that's, that's the one thing. Uh, so let's take a look from the technology point of view. What sort of technology or AI technology we are actually trying to use in this case? So this is actually a very simple uh, AI technology uh, and which is basically a prediction algorithm. Uh, to be more specific, this is actually called a regression algorithm. Okay, there are actually many different machine learning algorithms that can do this. So we uh, will leave it at this because you can ask the experts, but you know that this is actually something that you can do and we have identified the kind of a technology that can do this okay so it's a prediction algorithm of a regression sort top left hand corner what problem actually are we trying to solve when we're trying to reduce the risk of our stock levels we are trying to basically predict the sales right so if you, if you are able to predict the sales then we are able to predict what is the corresponding stock level that you need to be able to match that it's important because if you actually try to be too safe by your guesstimate and that means you always underestimate okay because you don't want to have overstock then you actually you will have a lot of missed opportunities all right you have a lot of stock outs because actually the real uh demand is much higher than what you guesstimate to be on the other hand you can be overly optimistic and then you end up with the problem that we're trying to solve right too much stock of uh, slow moving products so those are the two things. So then we move uh, into the more inner level is uh, number, first one is how does this actually improve productivity, okay, from a human point of view. So you're able to reduce error, but in terms of productivity, having a more optimal estimate of the amount of stock level that you need basically helps you to optimize your supply chain. Not only do you have less uh, inventory, but you also need to ship less goods, right? Why ship unnecessary goods only for them to, sort of gather space in your, uh, in your, on your shelves. And the other thing is actually warehousing. Actually, warehousing is very expensive uh, thing to, to, it's not only tr the transport is a problem, but warehousing, I mean, warehousing space, if you use it unnecessarily, it really uh, eats into your budget. So you would actually want to have a more optimal uh, warehousing as well. That will help you to be more productive. And how does this overcome some human limitations? So as I said, AI is a superpower, right? So what sort of super, how does this superpower help you to actually uh, overcome some human limitation? So in this case, actually, actually being able to predict something within 10, plus minus 10% may need you to actually go through a lot, a lot of data. Think about a supply chain that actually supplies this product to the whole of Singapore. You're not just talking about one single store, but a chain that actually supplies this SG widgets to the whole of Singapore, maybe to the whole of Malaysia and maybe to the whole of uh, Indonesia as well. With that kind of volume of data, which may be running into hundreds of thousands of items, uh, humans really cannot see the pattern. That's why we guesstimate because it's just too much information, information overload. But an algorithm doesn't get tired, it doesn't get bored, it will just crunch through it. That's why AI can achieve very much higher accuracy than what a human can do uh, if we, as a human, direct it towards the, towards the right task. That's what AI cannot do, right? It cannot decide for itself what's the task that it should be doing. But that's what a human is very good at, providing the context. But when it comes to the number crunching, uh, you have to leave it to the AI. It's going to do it, outdo you every time and any time. And the bottom part is basically uh, when we are actually uh, deploying AI, we need to bear in mind that a uh, situation does change, right? So we need to actually continually monitor the performance of any AI solution. Uh, today, the predictions are accurate within 10%. Next month, maybe it drifts a bit. So we need to actually mo keep monitoring the performance. Uh, and this is also something which uh, people often forget about when they deploy AI solution. I've seen too many chatbots out there being deployed by companies hoping to improve the customer service, but they did not factor in that they need to retrain the chatbot, right? As the chatbot gets more input from the users or the users start asking about other things, you need to retrain the chatbot. You cannot just uh, fire and forget, right? So most AI solutions, uh, because they learn from the data and the data actually changes with time, you need to have this uh, preset triggers, okay, uh, and plan the retraining uh, or redeployment re uh, of the AI. 
So the next part is actually a slightly more technical. So we have the AI uh, algorithm that we want. So what are some of the things that we need to take care of in order for this algorithm to be able to work? Okay, so for number one is that we must have the data, right? So this is an advantage uh, if you are on an e-commerce platform. So for most e-commerce platforms, whether it's mobile commerce, uh, e-commerce, uh, web commerce, or live commerce, now more recent in the pandemic, people start streaming live video auctions, right? Live commerce. Uh, they gather data and that data can be used to really give you a real-time estimate of your possible stock levels and sales levels. Now, if you are running a more uh, traditional retail store, uh, that data may not be so easily captured, but it is actually still there. It's in the uh, point of sale systems, right? So if you have the interface to the point of sale systems, you can actually get the transaction data and estimates from there. But what's not present in the point of sale system would be the last one, the ratings. E-commerce systems, they have reviews, they have ratings that the customer give. That's actually a tremendous uh, input for estimating future performance of the product. Uh, but it's not present in the uh, point, normal point of sale system. But there's social media. If you're able to actually uh, also do uh, some uh, information crawling from the social media itself, you can relate the data, okay? It's not the best uh, directly related. So the best is, is to get data feed from your e-commerce system or X-commerce system. But you can still uh, achieve some of these ratings from uh, just uh, having a social uh, web uh, Facebook page. But don't just use a human to read out the data. A human will die, right? So extract the data out. Take advantage of things like natural language processing to extract the information about the ratings for your product. Lastly, what well, additional things that you need to get your data ready? Um, as I mentioned just now, uh, you, because the data is actually coming in from multiple channels, uh, you need to relate the data. The data fusion will be one of the key challenges uh, in getting this to work. And, and secondly, uh, some validation is necessary because uh, as Lawrence mentioned earlier, garbage in, garbage out is definitely a truism in the machine learning. If you feed the machine learning algorithm, it is a very good student. It will just learn from the bad data anyway. Right? So you, you have to be very careful about what you're feeding into a machine learning system because uh, people can try to game the system. For example, fake reviews, right? Fake news is definitely a problem these days. So you need to try to remove uh, that noise from the uh, social, need, uh, social, social network service, SNS, before you use that information. So that's it. With that, we have uh, taken a simple business problem uh, and thought around about it. Uh, I hope this business canvas can help you on your journey to get started with somewhere in the AI world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Leong. Thank you, sir. Uh, you still got slides? You're done already? I'm uh, done already. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, and, and Dr. Leong has very kindly, and I know uh, because depending on the screen that you, you are using, some of you for the your, your screen, because it's a bit smaller, might not have seen the entire canvas. So I've got a special thank you uh, gift for everyone. You can head to this link on your screen right now. I'll also put it in the chat function below to download this canvas. Okay, just follow the link. It is also going to now appear on the chat function and you can download your copy, high definition of the business AI canvas toolkit. This is our way of saying thank you so very much for joining us this Friday afternoon. Uh, we also would like to ask for your feedback on the areas that we did well and where we could have done even better uh, by filling up our feedback form that's on your screen right now. Uh, you can scan the QR code to give us any feedback that you might have. So remember to pick up your free copy of the AI Business Canvas and also head to the necessary site to give us your feedback. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one more course of business, which is to say a very big thank you to many different groups of people. The first group of people I want to say thank you to are our organizers. A few of them are actually here with us live at the studio. Let's bring them on. Come, come, Audrey, come, 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 come. Tell me, all shy. Ah. Okay, okay. So many of them are working very hard behind the scenes. They are a bit shy, but I really want to take some time to acknowledge them, right? Audrey, Helmi, Shannon, Jen, uh, D, all of you that have worked so hard to put this together 
congratulations and thank you to our organizers. A big virtual round of applause to Singapore Polytechnic for putting this together. I want to say a very big thank you also to our speakers, panelists from UOB, from AISG from Singapore Polytechnic as well as my team from Adrenaline working very hard, hard behind the scenes to put this entire show up for you. And last but not least, most importantly, I want to say thank you to you. Thank you for taking time to learn, to educate and to inform yourself about AI by joining us at the Singapore Polytechnic AI Virtual Symposium. This event is not possible if you did not give us your support and time. So thank you very much. And if you're embarking on your AI journey, all the very best. On behalf of everybody involved, my name is Ricardo. It is Friday. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.